Amen. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Hallelujah. And for those of you who haven't quite got here yet, happy holidays. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's good to see you this morning. Folks still coming in, find a place. We're just now getting started. The fire's on. Uh, by the way, speaking of the fire being on, does it feel warm in here? It's just my imagination. It's just kind of, maybe it's mostly muggy and sticky. I want you to maybe hit a couple of those units for me right quick and uh, bump it down at least a degree or two. Get some of this humidity out there. And I think it's like 68 degrees outside, but it feels like 90 with all the humidity. Amen. Oh, welcome to Christmas in Houston. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Nothing like it whatsoever. Uh, if you don't like it, wait a little bit. A couple of hours, it'll be rainy, and after that, it'll be cold and back warm again. So praise the Lord. You know, I'm preaching a series of, of messages during the holiday season, a few messages that deal with uh, debunking some of the mythology and uh, folklore around holidays. And sorry, I'm not going to be talking about Santa today, but we are going to be talking about some other things that have suddenly have been uh, misrepresented, I believe, and haven't been necessarily true to the Word of God. Uh, I know when I preach these sermons like this, it certainly messes up our nativity scene a lot of times. Because uh, <laughs> we, we have this preset mind, especially when we talk about the, the wise men from the East. Uh, so the title of the message is Wise Guys and Starry Skies. And uh, I want to talk about over the next, this Sunday and next Sunday, about this particular instrument, instru incident, I'll get it right in a minute, of the wise men coming from the east and the star that, that led them. We're going to try to get down to the reality of what took place. And we'll look at the Bible and we'll look at history and we'll see uh, what, uh, what the Bible has to say. And then look at the actual definitions of some of the words that I really believe is, is the trouble many times with the English language. When we translate scriptures from Greek and Hebrew, we certainly lose a multitude of things just by the nature of the English language. So... Uh, we want to look at what does the Bible teach us and try to get some of these things straight in our heads and hearts and minds for the specific reason of knowing what the Bible says and what does the Bible teach in this regard. So let's look at the, the wise man and the star that led them from Matthew chapter 2 and see what does the scripture have to say about this. All right, let me get going here. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 2 of Matthew. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi... From the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw a star in the east, and we have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard it, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he began to inquire of them where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means the least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And Herod secretly called the Magi and ascertained from them the time that the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and he said, Go and make careful search for the child. You found him. Report to me. That I, may, I may come and worship him. And having heard the king, they went on their way, and lo, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceeding with great joy, and they came into the house and saw the child with Mary and his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their own country by another way. Now, as you read this story, and it's a beautiful story, you know, our mind begins to try to visualize who these wise men were and just where were they from and how were they dressed and how did they get from there to there and what would be the journey and how long would it take and, uh, you know, uh, who were these supposed kings and how could a star in the heavens lead them to a specific house? over the baby that, that lay in the house. And, a lot of the, and maybe I'm just a little weird and different from you, but those are the kind of things that, you know, come into my mind when you start looking at the details of the, the journalistic of who, what, when, where questions, you know, of, of, of just what is, what's going on here. Who were these guys? Who were the wise men? And why do we call them wise men? Uh, what does the Bible have to say? And I think those are valid and good questions. So we'll start with as to who they were. We have two clues in Scripture, and that's going to be the basis of what we, we look at today as we look at these Christmas stories. What does the Bible really say? And we'll see it 
how we've certainly misconstrued or misidentified things when we learn just what the Bible is saying. Our first clue as to who they really were is found in the phrase in Scripture in verse chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 1, where he says they were wise men from, you know, they were wise men from the east. Now, the word for wise men, uh, translated uh, wise men, is really not, it's one of those words that just didn't translate real word. The Greek word for wise men here is, is uh, they're using is, is this word magoi, and it doesn't really translate wise men. There is another word for that, which is the word sophoi in the Greek, and literally that word is the word wise ones, all right, or wise men, speaking of this group. But the word used here is, is, is this different word, it's magoi, and it's O-I on the ending, we say magi, that's singular in the Greek language. The magoi in the Greek language would be a, a plural meaning, so what we have here is men, more than one or two, obviously, that you have here who are, that it doesn't necessarily translate to being wise after all, it really means it's a word for describing somebody who's noble or dignitary or a powerful person. And that's what the word actually has to mean. So I think sometimes we want to get down to wise men. We'd really say powerful men or wise, uh, you know, or, or, or great men, because that's where the word really, the word really uh, uh, leads to. And that's what we're going to look at today and, and see how does that play into the whole Christmas story and to the, them discovering the Lord Jesus and finding the Lord Jesus. The second clue, though, is, is the part that's a, a geographical clue, which really opens up the Magi as being the great ones or the powerful ones. And it it's, has to do with the geography. These men were from the east. Now, the, during the time of the Lord Jesus, there was, there was only one sprawling, powerful kingdom or empire to the east of, of Jerusalem and of Israel, and it was what we would call today modern-day Iran, or Persia. This was the, the Persian Empire. It was a vast and sprawling empire, uh, equal to that of Rome. It was a great empire. And they, these men were from the east. So I, I think it's fair to assume that, you know, that uh, although there may not be many wise men in Iran today, thank you very much, uh, <laughs> There certainly were during the time of Christ. And remember, this, this empire was, was, was at least on equal footing with the Roman Empire, and it was a great place. And our Greek word for uh, magoi, if you go to any encyclopedia to see what it's talking about, it'll refer you back to the Persian Empire and to who these, these men really were. In fact, they were rulers of, of Persia. They were, they were called the wise men in the King James Bible, a very, very... But they were very actually very important figures in the government of ancient Persia. The, the Persian uh, government had one governing body over them at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ in, in, in Persia. And it was, the, it was a body of leaders known as the Majestanes, all right? And the Majestanes were divided into two houses, kind of like the, the British Empire, you know, the, where you, you have the two different chambers. You, you had the upper house called the Magoi, the powerful ones, and the lower house members were the Sophoi. They were the wise ones, but these guys weren't from the lower house. These were Magi, the upper house. These, the, these so-called wise men of the Christmas story were actually powerful leaders who ruled over Persia in governing bodies over the Persian Empire during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you further look at little history, you're going to find out that these guys literally, uh, the main role of what they did in the empire, besides the governing, was to select the different kings for the empire. In fact, a little known fact in, in the Western world is these, these magi did really exist. They weren't mythological creatures. They were men who ruled in these, this governing body in the Parthian government during the time that Jesus was born. Now, this, this empire, this, this Parthian empire, was led uh, by, by a government. Uh, this, this, the empire existed and was led by the Majestanes, at least, during several hundred years before Christ and a couple of hundred years after Christ. Uh, I think 247 to B.C. to 224 A.D., the government of Persia was this council of the Majestanes. And they, were, they served as, a, as, as kind of a priesthood, in reality, in the government. And you became part of the Majestane council by birth. All right, it was a hereditary, it wasn't an election kind of thing where you got into this house and into this chamber. Uh, and they had ultimately the most important thing that they did within the governing body was to select kings. Who would be the ruling king? Now the story has, at least within history's context, that about the same time that these men made their journey to go find the king of kings, they had just dethroned a very wicked and bad king over Persia. 
the, the ultimate purpose of them was to basically select the kings that would be next in line. Now, they're coming as, uh, into the story here, we see them coming as kingmakers, powerful men who have the authority of their government to select and to, to, to find kings for the Persian Empire. Now, there's, there's, there's a passage in Scripture that gives us a, some real insight to what's going on at this particular time. These men are coming to find the king. And obviously something within them, and I'll explain a little bit more in just a moment about this, that uh, they understand the times and the seasons of when to find this particular king. They had to have some knowledge of prophecy about when the king of kings would be born. And so they're pursuing, based upon the information that they have within the Majestane Council. Now there's only one prophecy, and only one prophecy in regard to the time of Messiah's coming. Now we know there's lots of prophecies concerning the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and you know even where he would be born like Bethlehem and lots of prophecies that tell us from Isaiah and other prophets and Ezekiel that talk about Messiah and who would come and his role in his ministry that from the suffering Savior to the ruling Messiah we have all those promises but you know there's only one section of scripture that talks about the time when he would be born. Now the first coming of Jesus does have a specific time stamp on it and it's found in Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 26. Now the second coming of Jesus, we don't have such a clear time stamp, all right, uh, as to what they do. Uh, in Daniel we have that prophecy that talks about, and we've talked about this ourselves in years past when we've studied biblical prophecy about this prophecy of Daniel in chapter 9. It's called the, the, the prophecy of the, the 70 weeks. So I want to read that to you, verses 24 through 26 of Daniel. And we'll see that these men were pursuing uh, on the basis of what these dates were that were given to them hundreds of years before Jesus was born by the prophet Daniel. It says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city, and he tells what these 70 weeks are about. We're going to, during this time, we'll finish the transgression, make an end of sin, make reconciliation for iniquity, bring an everlasting righteousness, seal up the visions and prophecy, and anoint the most holy. Therefore, know and understand that from the, the going forth of the, where I just lost my place, therefore, know and understand that from the going forth of the commandment and restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, and the streets shall be built again and the wall, even in troubled times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end there shall be a flood unto the end of the war of desolations are determined. Now, this is some great, powerful scriptures which theologians have, have, have boiled over for centuries and centuries, but they're really, they're really time stamps. And it kind of starts with that verse where he's talking about that from the time that something in history takes place, Daniel's saying there's going to be something that happens in the future. In other words, he says, here's the way he put it, there'll be a decree issued to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. You know that from the date that this decree to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem, that from the date that decree is given, there's going to be 70 weeks in prophecy. Now, bear with me, those who've been through the study understand that each, you know, each day of a week represents a year. So each week is seven years long. Now, 70 weeks. The 70th week is described in, in Scripture and even more clearly in Revelation. The 70th week of this block of years, all right, who's talking about? The 70th week is the, is the week of tribulation, the seven years of tribulation, all right? During the seven years of tribulation, we know what's going to happen. It's going to be the abomination of desolation. The Antichrist is going to rise. He's going to make a false peace treaty with Israel and with the, the enemies round about it. And then he's going, to, he's going to declare himself to be God in the middle of that peace treaty. He's going to take his seat in Jerusalem. And we see a lot of things that take place, all right? Uh, during the 70th week. And that's the time of tribulation. But before you ever get to 70 weeks, there's the 69 weeks. And they're, they're dissected here. He even talks about the, the, the 69 weeks and apart from the 70 weeks. 70 weeks is that end of tribulation period of time. Now, somewhere in history, the Messiah was cut off. And he tells you exactly when it would be. He said it would be at the end of the 69th week that Messiah would be cut off. And by the way, that means that Messiah would be cut off. That's the crucifixion of Jesus. If you were to sit down with a calculator, pencil, and pad and go back to the time when the decree of, you know, was issued in Nehemiah to go back and rebuild the walls, all right, that from that date that that decree is given for him to go, the number of years from that date to the day that Jesus was crucified would be this 69 weeks, 69 periods of seven years. All right, you can do the math on it. 
That would be the time. It is interesting to note that that's a very specific date given in Scripture. If, that, if, that, if Jesus doesn't die on the 69th week, into the 69th week, oh, that's no good, right? But Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem at the end of the 69th week, just as the prophecies were told. And at the very end of that, it, that 69-week period ended at the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We haven't started the 70th week yet. That'll begin with the, with, with the tribulation period. We have this period of time which we call the church age right now. This whole time is, is about Israel. It's not about the church, and it's not about, it's not about the rapture. It's really about God dealing with the nation of Israel. He says, you know, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy city, to, to do what? To finish the transgression, to make end of sins, to make reconciliation, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up visions and prophecy, to anoint the Holy One and the Most Holy One. The week that Jesus entered Jerusalem for the crucifixion was 69 weeks from the time the commandment to build Jerusalem was given to them. So isn't that a unique, I guess, coincidence for some, all right? We call it a God incidence. It's right on time, right in the place. Daniel received this vision and recorded this, this prophetic vision while living in captivity. Can you guess where he was in captivity? Well, I think you should know if you know any little bit of Bible history. That, that Daniel recorded this while he was serving in the Persian court and most likely as a majestane in the Persian court. You remember the story of the Jews and how that uh, when they were carried into different captivities, how that, 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 that uh, they seemed to always rise like cream, you know, or, you know, to the top and always be given places of authority. We know of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, we, we tell the story about the three Hebrew children. They weren't children. The three Hebrew boys were not boys. They were men. And not only were they men, if you study the scriptures in Daniel, they were leaders of provinces in Persia. All right? You remember the, the story of Daniel? He was carried away. There, there, was the, there were a couple of captivities that took place with the, with the, with the children of Israel over, over periods of time. And during those times, whether it was the Syrians who came in or the, or the Babylonians, and then Babylonians who took Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, uh, then the Persians came in behind the Babylonians, which was part of Babylon. The Medo-Persian Empire took over that. But Daniel remained in the places of authority. And so did Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. So they're familiar, these, these, these Persians, obviously, in their history, are familiar with a prophecy that was given by someone in leadership in their, own, in their own nation. They were aware the Magi were. The Magi Council was aware of the prophecies of Daniel concerning the Messiah and concerning a king. Why? Because he had served as the chief administrator of the Magi at one particular time. He was second in authority in the Persian Empire. And he, he taught them about God. They had seen demonstrations like with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And they'd seen demonstrations like with Daniel in the lion's den. They, they saw the reality of God. These guys didn't live in closets and behind the curtains somewhere. They were bold. They were forthright. And they were brought into places of authority in these governments. And during this particular time that Daniel's prophecies were written, you know, they were even written into Persian literature. In fact, during this particular time, although they didn't serve God, these Persian empires, they followed the, the Bible of Zoroastrianism, which Zoroaster wrote. Uh, he had a, his book was called the Zendavista, and this was the Bible of the religion of the land of the Persians at the time. And the time that Jesus was born is born during that Zoroastrian time. But understand that Daniel was so well respected by one of his students who didn't convert to the Hebrew God, but he wrote this Astro Zoroastrianism Bible, he put Daniel's prophecies in it. So they are even to this day still within the Zoroastrian religious book that prophesied about a coming king, a Hebrew king, that he would come and that he would be the great prince, he would be the great king, and he would be the great ruler of all mankind. So they're aware, at least in the context of their writings, as well as their teaching in the presence of Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, of a coming king. They're even aware, I believe, of all those Hebrew scriptures which Daniel brought with him, of a star. In fact, Numbers 24 or 25 talked about how, in chapter 24, I believe it was, in the Old Testament was a book they'd be familiar with. And in that particular book, it talks about a star that would rise up over Judah. So they're familiar with these things. They're familiar with this passage in the whole of the Bible. So they're not just journeying because there's obviously a sign given, that's part of it, but they're journeying also because it's the time. 
that a king is supposed to be born. During this particular period, something is going to happen. You take, they know there's a particular general period of about, you know, 14, 15 years is going to take place, something to, to 30 years, the life of Jesus. They know that particular period of time is in that last, those last couple of weeks of the 69 weeks. And so they're going to make a journey based upon that, along with this witness of a, this stellar, uh, uh, starry event that takes place. You put everything together, and you see that they're not astrologers, and they're not astronomers, that their part, their understanding is based upon a history. It's based upon a reality of people who taught them certain things. So I don't think you can conclude that they were astrologers. It's more likely that they were part of the legacy of Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even though <coughs> trained in all the wisdom of the, of the East, they responded and submitted only to the true God. And they brought those teachings into that Eastern part of the world around them. So they weren't astrologers as some people like to talk about and some people like to believe. I believe that they perhaps were either familiar and more likely they were even descendants. Remember what I said about the Majestane Council. You can see this in history books and encyclopedias. You got into it by birth was the major part. Daniel and them got into it by captivity. They were taken in and then raised and given those prominent positions and honored by giving those government leading positions. Now they're part of that council. Guess who gets to be part of that council now? Their sons get to be part of that council. So they're probably descendants of Daniel who was descendant of Abraham who understand these prophecies. There's gonna be a certain time in history it starts with a decree that be given. Start counting off years by, by weeks to get to a time when a king would be born. Add that to the fact that they're familiar. Obviously, what the scripture teaches about a star should come from, over, over, from Jacob. You put all those things together and you begin to see that their interest in Christ is quite unique because it's based upon all this history that they have with Daniel. They're, they're, they're interested because they were possibly the sons of Abraham, as I've said before. Remember, the northern kingdom of Israel was taken captive by the Assyrians over 700 years before Jesus was born. The Assyrians came in, they captured, they carried off thousands of captives. 135 years after that, the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar came in and got Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. The choice men and women, the choice young people of the southern kingdom, which had been faithful to David's throne, to Judah and Benjamin, they're scattered throughout the whole Babylonian empire and they become people of influence. Now, why do they get such influence? Because of their character, because of their integrity. Character does matter. Care, integrity does matter. Even in a pagan culture that they were in, it's interesting to know how that the, the integrity and the character that they maintained and their devotion to the one true God was so attractive and so appealing to even the people that they were enslaved to. I still believe that's true today. I believe that when people choose to live in integrity and they choose to honor God with their life, that God honors us and God honors you when you choose to honor him in your life. And even though they went through hell and lion's dens and fires and pits and storms, God still did something in honoring them. Joseph is a great illustration of this, isn't he? Joseph's a great illustration of how he went through from the, the pit, the prison, then to the palace because of his integrity, because of his character, because God was on his life and people recognized, and he became the second ruler in Egypt. You know the story, but it's kind of the history of, of the way God moved in his people, so that even when this, this Parthian dynasty is there, uh, ruling in the time of Christ, Many of these magi could probably trace their ancestry back to Abraham through the Babylonian and Assyrian captivities, and they were living in those lands. And they became obedient to the governments, and those governments then came, counted them worthy that they eventually were ruling the people that ruled them. There's a great lesson in there if we could only learn it. Even, you know, the ancient prophecy from Mesopotamia, you know, the name, uh, there's a prophet named Balaam. He foretold the, co the, the coming in the star. Remember Balaam and his donkey? I've thought about preaching that sermon entirely dumb and dumber. <laughs> Even Balaam gave the prophecy in numbers about the star out of Jacob. So you see there's, there's this, this, in, this understanding from these people. So the Magi, they came, and they're interested in the birth of Christ. Now, you say, well, just, 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 just how, many, how, how many were there? 
Well, you know, we have, let's see, one, two, three over here in our scene. But the Bible doesn't say, we, we know that when you, when you look at it and it talks about magi, it ends with, as I said earlier, not with a singular, but with the plural ending of O-I, which means there were more than, than one. There could be two, there could be ten, there could be a hundred from this leading council that came. The idea is that they, you know, that, they, that we usually have from the traditional children's fairy tales and stories that attach themselves to Christmas, that we, three kings of, or, you, know, you know, the way it goes. But really, there's, there's a reason to believe that there were quite a few of these uh, noble personages that made this journey. On the walls of the catacomb in Rome, there's a lot of primitive paintings, and some of them represent the, the, the Magi, and they're part, they show pictures of them being a part of a very large entourage of soldiers who are traveling with them, who would serve as their bodyguards. Re remember, by the way, that you, you can hardly uh, think that wise men of this caliber, dignitaries, noblemen, would travel with just the three of them. By the way, as I said, you know, you have the Roman Empire and the Medo-Persian Empire. They're not friends. You know, there, there's enemies there. So you can't imagine them traveling alone. Uh, I think that the, the paintings in the catacombs of Rome show them traveling with hundreds, hundreds of soldiers. One of the articles that I was reading about the Majestane Council said that when they traveled, they never traveled with less than a thousand soldiers. So there's probably a very large group of people traveling across that desert land into Israel, coming from the east, riding to the west, and making that long journey, that there would probably be a very large group. I mean, anytime nobility travels, even in our own country, when you have presidents moving from place to place, they're moving with a very large group. So it wouldn't be much different even in this time, and probably even more so because of the animosities between the different empires that were ruling in the world at this time. So here you have these men, and how are they traveling? Well, some show them on, on camels and uh, camelback. Others depict them as, as kings with, with crowns, you know, and long cape robes with tips and tassels growing off of them. And you say, well, which, which you know, which, and some show them with Arab kind of, you know, gar, garb on. And uh, you have all these different pictures. You say, well, which one is it actually? Are, you know, just, are they dressed as Arabs? Are they dressed as Easterners? Well, the ancient historians tell they were they were the best of questions, for, first of all, that they're not riding camels, even though our picture shows that, that this Persian army was, was the most elite cavalry in the world at the time, and they fought on horseback, and they, they had cracked cavalry units that traveled with them. So you have these mounted troops, on, most likely on horses, personal servants to them following with that, which bound to be probably 100 men to each delegate that's, that's in the journey. So it's not three lonely travels. And then they're, they're not on camels because camels were used, at least in the Persian Empire, not for carrying people, but for carrying baggage. You know, they're the luggage carriers. No mighty ruler in that part of the world or even in the Roman part of the world would find themselves astride of a lowly, ugly camel. All right? There's just not much dignity in riding camels. So, you know, why be, you know, in a Ford Focus when you can be in a Cadillac or Mercedes? So here they are, they're traveling, and, and what they're wearing is, is not what you would think in the con context of the, the, the Bernus kind of garb of Arabs, nor the ermine tip robes of European kings with crowns upon. The dress is probably a Phrygian dress, a, a, a farther eastern group of people, and these oriental potentates probably wore shorter capes and conical shaped caps, uh, more like the oriental kings would wear during that particular time. You'd expect that because they're not from the west, they are from the east. And so they're going to dress according to these. Now, the interesting part when you follow the story is when you get to that chapter in, in, in chapter 2, in verse, it talks about them, verse 1 and 2. It says, and then they make their way to Jerusalem. All right? It's the capital. What's the best place to go? You go to Jerusalem. Verse 3, it says, and when they arrived, Herod was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Now that we've heard about the size of the group and the kind of people that are in the group, Maybe we begin to get a little insight. Let me give you about five reasons why Jerusalem, the city, is troubled by this and Herod's troubled by it. Now, one, we could think, you know, we, 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 you have to first of all realize that you know, there's no less than what would be considered a small army has arrived at the gates of Jerusalem. And it's, it's not a Roman army which is in control. It looks like the staging, perhaps for a battle scenario, something bad's getting ready to happen. So everybody's upset. 
There's this, there's this powerful force to the east of them, which is one of the most forceful, formidable fighting armies of the day. And here they show up at the gates of Jerusalem. So no wonder they're a little, a little troubled about it. Second of all, they're troubled because most of the garrison, the Roman garrison that protected Jerusalem, was not there. There was only a small contingent left to protect Jerusalem because there was an uprising that had taken place in Armenia. And so it's the uprising taking place in Armenia. The Romans had pulled the majority of their troops away from the city. So they're really unprotected this time, especially for such this force that would come against them. So it, uh, Jerusalem's troubled. Herod's troubled. The third reason, Palestine as some like to call it, Israel, had, was the buffer state between the great Roman Empire to the west and this great Persian Empire to the east. It's kind of the central, it's the passing gate. You gotta go through here if you're gonna take one of those nations. It's gonna come in against one of the other empires. It's gonna be the battleground. In fact, the Bible tells us that in the end times it will be, that area of the world will be a final battleground at, Mag at Armageddon. So here, you know, is this gargantuan Persian Empire to the east and the other side is to the, to the west is the great gargantuous Roman Empire. And here's Jerusalem, right stuck in the center of everything that's going on. So the appearance of a big group of soldiers at the gates of Jerusalem seems to little be just a little bit daunting. And so no wonder it says that Herod and Jerusalem are troubled. But I said five reasons. The fourth is this. Herod had seen these Persians before. Or maybe I'd put it better to say he'd seen them behind. Because 30 years before this, he had hightailed it from Rome to Rome with a Persian cavalry at his heels. He'd gone to Rome... Herod had, the city set on the seven hills, to plea for help from Mark Antony and from Caesar Augustus to have the Roman Senate proclaim him to be king of the Jews. Now, he wasn't even a Jew. Well, he had partial Jewish blood in him. But, you know, he wanted to be proclaimed as king of the Jews. Uh, and then he also was asking them to provide him a large enough garrison in Jerusalem so that he could maintain the title as king of the Jews for the Romans. And so that had been his plea, but he'd gone to Rome with a lot of these guys trailing, trying to kill him before. So now you see why Herod is a little bit troubled, but it doesn't stop there. I said there's five reasons. The fifth reason is this. This, he was an Idumean Arab. He now heard the awful news. <clears throat> there's another king in town. Somebody else has been born, and it's born by prophecy. Somebody that perhaps, if prophetic, then it must mean God has delegated something. Now there's another monarch, a monarch not like him, that's kind of in superficially put into place by Romans, who had no right even if he, you know, it, it, by his birth to be the king of the Jews. But he now is there. He's getting ready to lose his place of authority and power if this particular thing is true. He's agitated for one thing and for one thing only. He himself, for that reason, ultimately the other four reasons for the rest of Jerusalem, they're agitated. You know, so you get this all of a sudden here in this, this day or evening, whenever it was when they arrived, there's a lot of tension in the city. There's a lot going on. So he, <clears throat> here's what Herod does. Being the smart guy that he thinks he is. He, gets the, he goes, first of all, the scribes and Pharisees, and he pulls them together, the priest, and he says, all right, there is a prophecy about a king. Yes. <clears throat> tell me about it. They tell me about it. Where is the king going to be born? The Bible says the prophecies, if we follow the prophecies, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. It, and that's another one of those God incidents things. You know, this prophetically not only told when to be born and when he would die, but when, 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 you know, that, uh, the where, the place of, of, that he'd actually be born be Bethlehem. So he gets this word and then he says, and he secretly calls the Magi to a council. He gets them there together. And, you know, this is politics at its best. This is like Washington. <laughs> You just see him, he's got the table set, you know, the wine's being poured, the best of servants are in, these guys are being treated like royalty that they are, and he says, oh, you know what, you guys are just brilliant. And uh, you, you, you want to go see the king, why? We want to worship him, and we have gifts to present. Well, me too, isn't that a coincidence? Me too! So <clears throat> when you find out exactly where he is, tweet me. <laughs> Get back with me. Let me know too. Because I want to go worship too. What a snake. Because we know what happened when they didn't go back, right? It says they were warned by God not to go back to Herod, so they left. So a little time goes by. We don't know how much time goes by. And he sends a slaughter unit into Bethlehem to kill all the, the children. Which God gives a word to 
Joseph and Mary to get out of Dodge. And they fly into Egypt to get out of there. Herod's not interested in anything but himself and his own hide. And he's out to destroy any king that could possibly secede him on any level whatsoever. So he wants to depose the king before he ever has the opportunity to come to a throne and to have him killed. Now, the real wisdom, if we want to call them magi, as I said, that's not really the most accurate of translations. But obviously, they do demonstrate a great deal of wisdom. They demonstrate a great wisdom. In fact, they know the scriptures. They demonstrate great wisdom that they're, they, they understand the prophecies of Daniel to, 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 to an obvious degree. They don't know all of it because now the passage about uh, Bethlehem is given to them. And they're putting all the pieces together. But they demonstrate a great deal of wisdom. And the first thing is that they follow the light they had. They had, they had instruction. We see now that Daniel was an influence in the Parthian Persian dynasty. Now we know where they got the scriptures from. Now they've seen also another prophetic event take place. One that they're familiar with. And we'll talk about the stellar event next Sunday. Now, they put all those things together. And they make their way to where? It doesn't say that the star led them the whole journey. It took them, obviously, to get started. And then they go to, to where, where, where did I find a king? I go to the capital, amen? They get to Jerusalem. And then they get further insight from the scriptures. Now, a lot of times, have there been times in your life you said, man, I wish they had a star telling me what to do. You know, I wish I had a star. Give me a sign from God. Hey, you have to realize that we don't need an external light anymore. That glory of God abides within us. God in you, the hope of glory. Amen. God lives in you. If you're a child of God, if you're a born-again believer, if you committed your life to Jesus Christ, you have light. The Word is a light unto your feet, a lamp. The Word of God is life and light. The Word of God is direction. But not only do we have the Word of God, we have the Holy Spirit to confirm the Word of God, to use the Word of God, to implant the Word of God, to remind us of the Word of God. We have everything that is needed to be wise men and women. God has gifted us. That's why your pastor is constantly beating you over the head in the most gentle ways, of course. Get in the Word. Get in the Scriptures. Learn the Word of God. Quit just getting it secondhand. Read it. Understand it. Study it. Believe it. Obey it. Get in the Word of God. And we can demonstrate the same kind of integrity and the same kind of discernment that these people demonstrated hundreds or thousands of years ago. The wisdom is that they're following light. We've been given light. The Word of God. The Holy Spirit of God, they give everything that we need if we're going to be what God's called us to be. But not only did they follow light, they worshiped Christ and not Mary. Now, I know this is a sensitive subject in some arenas because, especially within the context of the Catholic Church, there's a lot of Mary worship that goes on. But you have to study the Scriptures. The Scriptures does not give any indication. In fact, it's very clear that they, it says they came into the house and they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell down and worshipped who? Him. him. And they opened their treasures and they presented to him. him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. They were there not because of Mary, not because of Joseph. They didn't worship the star. They didn't worship. In, they wanted to meet the king. Not the creature, but the creator. The tragedy is, according to Romans chapter 1, is that men become vain in their imaginations and they worship the creature more than the creator. Now, whether that applies to Mary or yourself, putting yourself above God, it's still the same thing. The wisdom of these men is found is, you know, that they came and they presented their gifts to him. They wanted to see him. Wise men still seek him. He's what the story is about. He's what history is about. He's what your life is about. And if you want to discover the world, if you want to discover yourself, if you want to discover life, if you want to discover destiny, sense of purpose, meaning, you're going to find it in discovering Him and looking to Him and seeking Him and pursuing Him. There are religious cults out there that will encourage the veneration of Mary. They'll call her the Queen of Heaven. They'll call her a co-redeemer. They'll call Mary the co-mediator, the sinless one. But there's no place in the Bible, and there's no place where Jesus even spoke up, where that's a truth. She's not a co-mediator. There's only one mediator between God and man. And his name is not Mary. His name is Jesus. It says, they fell down and worshipped him. To do anything else would show themselves as not so wise, nor so noble. 
And I think that, you know, there needs to be a clarity in this regard because so many people have been duped by men instead of by hearing what the Bible has to say. So why do they worship him? Because he is Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Because they were careful enough students of scripture and prophecy to realize that the Godhead deity would be found in a one person, and that one person is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the object of everything we're about. He is the object of our worship. He's the object of our adoration. He's the object of our gifts, ultimately. Any creature of God, regardless of how pure and how noble and how wonderful, and Mary was a wonderful woman. God, God blessed Mary, all right? She was, a, she was a pure, blessed woman of God. But she wasn't anything more than that. Anything than you and I might be blessed of God. She's not a, go, a goddess. And the Magi knew that. They were indeed noble men of the highest order. They were indeed wise men of the highest order. And if we too would choose to be noble and choose to be wise, and we'd be the same kind of people who follow the light of God's word, who listen to the light and the leadership of God's Holy Spirit in our life, who embrace the truth of God's word, and who focus our affections, our tensions, and our heart upon Jesus Christ. You've probably seen the signs. I've seen them popping up on church billboards everywhere. Wise men still seek him. Have you seen that one? Wise men not only seek him, they worship him. They worship. But wise men not only seek him, and wise men not only worship him, wise men still bring gifts. People don't comprehend that today. We'll sit and argue with God about 10 cents on a dollar. <laughs> well, it kind of sounds silly when you say it like that. <laughs> Amen? Amen? We argue with God on the, the smallest things. When everything that you and I have and hold comes from Him. If it weren't for the grace of God, you wouldn't be sitting here drawing a breath. If it wasn't for the grace of God, you wouldn't be living here in a nation whereby you have opportunities to, to freely seek Him. God has blessed you in more ways than you can even begin to write down on a piece of paper. The volumes of books would not contain what He's done for you alone in this life. If you would take the time to see and wisdom would dictate that we should take the time to worship and adore and seek and praise and honor Him with our lives, our finances, our families, our homes, our church. He should be a bit at the very core. He should be in leadership of every portion of our life if we're going to be the same kind of men who represent nobility and wisdom and grace and honor. So we start taking away parts some of these stories and looking at history and scripture, we begin to see a little bit different picture. These guys endured a long, long journey because they wanted truth. And for us today, truth is right in front of us. Some of you may be sitting here today and you've been around truth all your life and you've heard it all your life. You've had people praying for you most of your life and yet you still haven't embraced it. You still haven't said, fallen on your own knees and said, Jesus is my Lord. I'd encourage you today to take the opportunity that God's given you and exercise some wisdom and give your heart and your life completely to the Lord today. Some of you that are believers, you, you've walked with God. You, you know what it means to walk with Christ, but your life has become kind of this state of uh, neutrality where you're not really, you know, there's no boldness. I mean, if you were living in the Persian dynasty, you know, you, they probably wouldn't have made you a leader <laughs> because they haven't seen integrity. And what more important than anything else in your life is this element of, 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 of honoring God with your life and your testimony, that you have a testimony, that people can look at you and say, they're different because they believe God. Their life's unique because I can tell they're pursuing God. They're seeking first His kingdom and His righteousness. God's adding to their life. Let that be true of your life. If somewhere you've gotten stalled and stagnant, lukewarm perhaps you'd slow down enough today to let God speak to you and say God I need to get back in course and on course with you in my life take complete control therein lies wisdom the Bible makes it very clear there's two ways to live your life there's the way of the world there's the way of the word the way of the world looks good but the Bible says it's the foolishness of men 
the way of the word looks difficult, but therein lies the wisdom of God. In it, out it, of it, what's it going to be? Let's stand with our heads bowed.